Hi, welcome back to Africa. So last time I left you, we were going across Botswana and trying to get to Victoria Falls, which is on the Zambezi River, where Zambia and Zimbabwe meet. You can see it right where that red arrow is. So we finally got there, and this is Victoria Falls. You can see that it's about four soccer fields wide. That's 400 yards from one side all the way to the other, super wide. And then it falls down a full soccer field, 100 yards down. You can notice that at this time in 1996 in Africa, uh, there were no guardrails there, and so people could walk right up to the edge and look at it. Uh, and actually, it's true that people would slip and fall from there each year. Uh, so I probably shouldn't have been out that far, but I was lucky and I didn't have any problems. Super beautiful. I hope you can go to Victoria Falls someday. When you are there, you can whitewater on the Zambezi River. Uh, I did what's called a Class 5, and that is the uh, most uh, rough whitewater you can go on that a commercial company will take you on. So I don't know any of these people, but we're all friends for that day. And you can see me excited about going and let's see what happens. Oh man, there we are. That's me in the front. I am on a thrill ride going down the Zambezi. That guide from Zambia is amazing with his row rowing, trying to get us through that. We've all dropped our paddles and then, oh boy, into the drink we go. Uh, we went into the water, I think two times. Um, and luckily we were safe both times, but it is the most amazing trip you could have. After that, we uh, went through uh, Zambia. You can see uh, us catching rides. We were camping, and then we got a ride with this guy named Godfrey, uh, which was really awesome. Uh, he took us through Zambia, and then we took some uh, buses as well. Uh, now, you can see my friend Seth reading that book, Fuzzy Logic. Uh, and what do you see with those guys? Both guys, actually all three guys on either side, you'll see they're actually looking over his shoulder and reading. And that's because at this time in Africa, there were not libraries like you have here. You know, you can just walk into the school library or the Berkeley Public Library and get any book you want. Uh, people there, they don't have that. And so oftentimes when we were traveling, people just ask me for the book I was reading. Sometimes I was in the middle of it and I would say, well, you know, I'm not done yet. But if I was done, I would give it to you. And so I did hand out books oftentimes to people. Uh, so I hope that you will feel grateful for the access to books that you have knowing that there are people throughout the world who wish they could have access to books. And in fact, uh, later on when I got back to America, I donated money to a nonprofit called Books for Africa, where they send books over there. Uh, we met uh, two guides in Malawi who showed us around. You can see one of them was named Godfrey, another Godfrey. I don't know why there's so many Godfreys at this time in Africa. Sometimes I think they choose names from movies that they see from America. And there was a very famous old movie called My Man Godfrey. So maybe that was an inspiration. And then also you'll see at the bottom that beautiful uh, picture of the sun setting over Lake Malawi. And that red arrow is showing you where Malawi is. All right. So while we were in Malawi, uh, we uh, actually got to the point where I played in a soccer game there. Uh, and actually what it was, it was the Carvers against uh, the local, um, what's it called? The local technical school. Uh, so the technical school actually had uh, uniforms, but the carvers didn't. Uh, so I was playing just my uh, regular clothing there. And the way that I got into this game was I was talking to one of the carvers and I was talking about how much I love soccer. And then my guides kind of helped me uh, just have a guest appearance. And that's Lake Malawi in the background. So sometimes when the ball will get kicked out of bounds, it'll actually land in the lake. It was kind of cool. And then you'll see that curious young girl walking behind her mother with the baskets on their head. Seth and I were walking behind them and we'd be walking and she would fall behind her mother turning around, looking at us. And then she'd turn around and see her mom was ahead of her and she'd run up to catch up to her. And then she'd turn around, and look at us and she'd fall behind, fall behind. And then she'd run to catch up. It was super cute. And then finally, uh, out of Malawi, we took a, about an eight hour bus ride overnight. And you could see that we were so tired that we would just sleep anywhere. So you'll see Seth uh, just sleeping amongst the chickens and the babies uh, stretched out on the floor in between uh, the aisle. So while I was in Lake Malawi, um, there's a lot of malaria in Malawi, unfortunately. Uh, and while I was there, uh, there's also bargaining in Africa. So when you go to pay for something, uh, it, it's not a set price. So, you know, they'll say, oh, it's $40. And, and I'll say, no, 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 that's too expensive. $10. And I'll say, no, no, for, sir, for you, $30, $35. Okay. And I'll say, no, 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 $15. And then you get to a price and eventually I'm like, oh, well, I'll just walk away. And as soon as you walk away, they will come running after. No, 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 no. Maybe we can do, a, we'll make a deal. And so you can see, uh, and one of the bargains I paid for this uh, uh, 
chair and the little set side table there. And not only did I uh, pay, I also told him at one point, oh, I'll, I'll give you, how about this? I'll give you $15 and I'll give you my shirt. And he laughed and he said, okay. And I took my shirt and I gave it to him. Uh, we got a ride. Uh, we were going to a place called Livingstonia. And we got a ride with this uh, man up here who's a Portuguese man with the hat there. Uh, and he was a uh, very interesting man. He was actually helping to construct the roads there. His company from Portugal was actually helping to construct the main highway along the lake. Uh, and we got to this place called Livingstonia. You go up all the way. And at the top of it, there's this just very, very peaceful town. And so we went and we saw the high school. And then we saw, we saw the elementary school. Uh, and in the elementary school, we actually got a tour from that principal. He was in the upper right-hand corner. He was really nice. He actually gave us a tour just for fun. Uh, and we went into the classrooms. Now that chalkboard there is a fifth grade classroom. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna show you what's written on that chalkboard in just a second. But we also went into a first grade classroom. You can see the classroom there. They're all sitting on the floor. There's no desk. They've got uh, papers in their hands and you can see it's very crowded. And then if you see all those kids uh, on the left-hand side, there's many kids who actually don't go to school. Those are the kids who would greet us as the train was pulling up and they would be begging for food or money. Um, so, you know, when when there's poverty, sometimes it's really hard to get an education. So, and school, they have to actually pay for school. So I hope that you will take this and think about how lucky we are uh, in California and in Berkeley to get an amazing education um, where you don't have to pay to go to it and you, you don't have to, you know, hope that the tourists will give you money uh, so that you can eat that night. So this is what was on that chalkboard. And what they're doing is they're talking about the partition of Africa. And that is when, um, Basically, you know, Africa was owned essentially by all these European countries. And after World War II uh, and into the 1960s, uh, they got a lot, a lot of Africa became free where they set up their own countries. But when they set up those countries, a lot of times the European countries would play a role in it. So this is a fifth grade classroom. And they're saying one of the good results of the partition of Africa into all these different nations was that slave trade was ended and a lot of tribal wars ended. And they also say that the introduction of Christianity was a positive. And that's because many, many people in Africa are Christian. The, the majority of Africa is actually Christian and follow that religion. Now, some of the bad results of the partition of Africa uh, would be that some Europeans still ill-treated Africans. Uh, and then countries were started without consulting their owners. In other words, uh, some of the territories that the Europeans controlled, they would just arbitrarily say, this is where the border is going to be. And sometimes uh, tribes will be split across borders, like the Maasai tribes are in Tanzania and Kenya. And then sometimes two tribes would be included in a country and those tribes maybe didn't have, didn't get along. So sometimes there would be civil war later because of that. And then uh, of course, unfortunately, the whole reason the Europeans went and colonized Africa was to get uh, resources. So a lot of the African resources were used to develop European countries. So when you think about how rich Europe is and the United States and how poor some other parts of the world are, you have to remember that that's because in colonization, oftentimes, uh, the richer countries go and they actually take resources from those other places. Uh, and in some places like South Africa, which we've learned about, uh, a lot of black Africans didn't, weren't even given power. Uh, the white uh, people who stayed behind, uh, or the white Africans who had become part of the country, oftentimes would retain power. Uh, and then there's these new boundaries created, which divided people and their kingdoms. All right, we left Livingstonia on a beautiful dawn day. That was the rest house that we stayed in. It was absolutely gorgeous. I would go back to Livingstonia if I could for sure. And we traveled across Malawi and Tanzania and you'll see that arrow pointing us and we're heading towards the beautiful African skyscape. Uh, we're going overland from Cape Town to the equator, which is a total 3,500 miles. Uh, we're going by train, bus, semi-truck, car, boat, foot, and even the back of a bike. You see Seth pointing to the man who's pedaling him, who we paid uh, to ride us across our border checkpoint. Uh, and 3,500 miles, that's just to give you an idea of how far that is. It's about 2,000 miles or so to go from San Francisco to New York. So we ended up in Zanzibar. Uh, and Zanzibar is the Spice Island. You'll see all these people we met there in Zanzibar. And you'll notice there... This uh, thing right here, what are all those people looking at? They're looking at this thing right here. It's a beautiful night scene on the streets of Zanzibar. What are they looking at? It is a communal TV that they're all standing there watching. And what are they watching? All these people, it turns out, are watching a documentary about the production of sugarcane. It was really cool. 
So uh, this is a beautiful seascape uh, that you see in Zanzibar. We met all these people uh, and we became friends with them and we went to the other side of the island um, and we were hanging out playing some frisbee on the beach. And what you saw in the background there were these things called dows. Dows are small boats that were originally from Arabia and they sail the monsoon winds to East Africa and India. So if you look over here, you'll see that for the summer from April to September, uh, the monsoon winds go from Africa over to India. And then the winter monsoons from November to March go from India to Africa. And so these Arabian dows would sail these things. And so there's actually a huge influence of India in East Africa and a huge influence of East Africa on uh, the coast of India. And in fact, if you watch the movie Gandhi, you will see that Gandhi actually started his career in South Africa. So this connection between India and Africa is quite big. Uh, Seth was making uh, sand castles here, so I took a photo of it. And then uh, there's a really great uh, spice tour that you can go on. So uh, Mr. Me Too's Spice Island Tours. So Zanzibar was a place where uh, spices grow. And so they take them from India and plant them in Zanzibar and travel to Arabia and around. And then all those trade things would take them up to Europe and China. Uh, and so you can go on a Spice Island tour. So you see cinnamon and you'll see all these different things, cardamom, all these different spices. Um, and at the end of that tour, there's a quick little story I want to tell you. So at the end of that tour, uh, I was with my friend and uh, well, his, right, this guy right here. So I was with my friend, Brian. And as we're at the end of this tour, um, what happens is there's a, a snuff is this thing that you can put in your nose and it makes you sneeze. A long time ago, it was made out of tobacco, uh, but they didn't have a tobacco snuff there. But what they had was another seed. So the, the tour guide says, oh, if you take this seed and you put it in your nose, uh, you are certain to sneeze, certain to sneeze. Does anybody want to try? And a whole bunch of people in my group wanted to try, but I was like, no, no, no I don't want to put that in my nose. So sure enough, people start putting the seed in their nose. Achoo, achoo, achoo. People are sneezing. Oh, it feels so good. It cleans you out, cleans you out. They feel great. And then, so my friend Brian, who was in another group, comes running over to me. He says, oh, Miko, did you, did you put the seed in your, in your nose to, to sneeze? And I'm like, no, no, I didn't want to do that. He's like, oh, it's brilliant. You got to do it. And I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to do it. He goes up to the guy. He's like, I, mate, he hasn't got one of them. Can you give him one? And so the, the tour guide gave me one and he handed it to me. I'm like, okay, fine. I'll put it in. So I put it in my nose and I'm like, okay, I got to sneeze. <sighs> ah, Brian, it's not working. He goes, oh, mate, that's so strange. Every single person in my group who put it in their nose, they sneeze. He's like, what's wrong with you? Get another one. Put another one in. I'm like, I'm not putting another one in. I can't even sneeze now. He's like, come on, come on. Just just try to sneeze. I'm like, hey, 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 yeah, I'm not sneezing. And he's like, oh, mate, just just put another one in. I'm like, no, no, no. So I went and I got some uh, tissues. And I just started blowing. <laughs> because it's all kind of viscous as a seed from a fruit. So what is the moral of this story? Don't put stuff up your nose. All right. So after Mr. Me Too's island tour, uh, we went off Zanzibar and I went into uh, central Tanzania. As you see, I saw another soccer game. I didn't get to play in that one, but uh, I did take a photo of it. And there's this beautiful church and I was walking by, I just heard amazing music from it. And I went in, I sat down in the upper balcony and there was a choir practicing and it was just the most beautiful experience. Okay. So I followed this group of people for a long time. What were they attending? Do you think you can guess? What were they attending? I'll give you a moment. Take a guess. Say it out loud. All right. They were attending a funeral. I was following them. I was so curious. They were walking around. I was like, what's going on? I just followed them and they let me and, and then I realized it was a funeral. So I felt very honored to be able to uh, watch that. So there is a man that I met there. This was another guide that I paid uh, to show me around. And his dream uh, was to turn this area into um, a, a tourist destination. It was not really a tourist destination at this time. So I ended up getting into a long conversation with him. He took me on this great hike up the mountain. You can see I had that great view. And one thing he told me has stuck with me for a long time. And he was telling me about his family. So basically, uh, he's the oldest. And he remembers that, you know, every year or so, uh, his parents would give birth to another kid. And so when he was the oldest, uh, he had, you know, two siblings. And when they had three people, kids in the family, 
uh, they had enough land that they could farm that everybody could eat. But as they got up into seven, eight, and nine children, the farm wasn't big enough for them to be able to have all the food they needed. And so that's when he became a tour guide. And so he was telling me that one of the things that he thinks is most important for Africa uh, is that they need to have some way of uh, having birth control, essentially, or family planning, where these families wouldn't get so large because he saw this happen in his family, where when there was just a few kids, they could afford and live a happy life. But once they had lots and lots of kids, it was very difficult. I thought that was fascinating. Um, okay. After that, I did meet up again with Brian and some of my friends who I had met from the British Isles in Australia. Uh, and we went to the Ngorongoro Crater, which you can see here. Uh, just, it's one of the most famous places to see wildlife. We were actually in a, this time it wasn't a walking safari, this time we were in cars. So it wasn't nearly as exciting, but we did get very close to the zebras uh, and you can see the wildebeest and so on and so forth. Uh, after that, Seth and I split off from uh, our friends, uh, who, by the way, I, I never talked to again, but it was fun while we were with them. And we went up to the equator. And the equator goes right through Kenya, as you can see right through here. Uh, and at the equator, uh, they have this thing where they give you this little um, uh, pitcher of water. And you can walk like 100 yards over here, and you put a little stick in the pitcher of water, and it goes down, and it goes down. Uh, you know, clockwise over here. And then you walk 100 yards the other way and you put in the stick and it goes counterclockwise there. And then you do it right on the equator and it goes straight down. Now, I did some research online to find out whether this is true and I didn't get a clear uh, answer on it. But uh, I thought it was interesting that this is what they had. Uh, and one of the things that they did for tourists was, you know, oh, when you're on the equator, water goes straight down the drain. Okay. We are now to Mount Kenya, uh, and that will be the next part of our stories. I hope you enjoyed our journey from uh, Botswana up to uh, Zambia and Zimbabwe, through Malawi, through Tanzania, over to the island of Zanzibar, back to Tanzania and Mount Kenya. Uh, lots of cool stories from Mount Kenya. See you next time.